Hello, Psych 101 students. Welcome to Module 3, Learning Objective 9. How do you experience emotions? We're going to begin with by looking at three major theories that attempt to explain your emotions. And you're going to see that there's, you know, this overlap and some similarities. They, they each kind of have one little thing different. So you, you, you know, you really have to try to keep these three theories straight. They often ask about them on the tests. Um, let's begin. We're going to go in order from the oldest to the newest of the three. So we're going to begin with the James Lang theory. This came out back in 1887. So a very early theory uh, of emotions. And the James Lang theory uh, says that when you experience a stimulus, you have a bodily response. That is, you know, like a, a physiological reaction. Then you feel the emotion. It is the bodily responses that make you feel an emotion. So you see that bear, the grizzly bear approaching. It causes a bodily response. So you, you know, so your body starts reacting before you've had the experience of, uh, of, of the emotion. Your heart's going to beat, you know, increase. Your palms may get sweaty. Um, and you label, you, well, not label, but the the bodily response causes you to experience an emotion. You know, my heart is beating so fast and my palms are sweaty, I am afraid. I feel fear. Uh, some evidence for, and what, what's important, actually, what's important to keep here is that your body responds before you have the experience of the emotion. So, and it, I mean, it's very quick, but when it comes before, your your body starts responding, and then you feel the fear as an emotion. Some evidence for this um, James Lang theory comes from something called the facial feedback hypothesis. And according to this hypothesis, uh, the muscles used to create a facial expression trigger your experience of emotion. So you can see the overlap or the similarities that, like, you're, if you're if you put your face into a smile, then it makes you feel happier. If you put your face into a, you know more of a frown, it makes you makes you feel sadder. So like your your emotions are responding to your body, as the James Lang theory says. So this was an actual study that they did. I don't have all the details, but. They made people either hold a pen in their mouth, like in picture A there, which causes you to, to use your smiling muscles. And they, they would have to hold it for a while. And they rated their, they, you know, they rated the, the feeling that the person had, you know, before and after. And, and, it, and people that use their smile muscles for a long period, you know, tend to feel, tended to feel happier afterwards. In the second, picture and B, if you hold a, a pencil like above in between your, your lip and your nose like that, it's actually you're using your frowning muscles. And people that had to maintain that for a while, it tended to make them feel sadder over time. Um, okay, uh, so the James Lang theory and the and the facial feedback hypothesis, they suggest that you're happy because you smile, not that you smile because you are happy, which is what, you know, the common person would say, hey, when I'm happy, I smile. When, if I'm sad, I cry. You know, what this whole theory is saying is that what these theories, the James Lang theory and the, and the facial feedback hypothesis, they're saying that you have the body reaction first. When you smile, then it gives you the emotion of happiness. When you you know, cry or frown, it gives you the emotion of sadness. Okay. 
So that's the first theory. The second is called the Canon Bard Theory. This theory came out in 1927. So, you know, about, oh, I don't know, about, about 40 years, it, it looks like, uh, after the first theory. And it was in response to the, the popular James Lang theory, which was popular at the time. And they took a different view in this theory. Um, according to this theory, when you experience a stimulus, you know, like the bear, you feel the emotion and experience physical reactions independently at roughly the same time. So the independent part is important. It's like the body reactions are not causing the emotion. The emotion doesn't cause the body reactions. They both occur simultaneously. So your brain processes the stimuli. There's a bear approaching you. And then at the same time, your body reacts and you get an emotion of fear. Okay, so the, you know, just slightly different James Lang theory had the body response coming before the emotion. This one has them occurring at the same time. The third theory is, is much, you know, well, a fair bit more recent. Um, this is the Schachter and Singer two-factor theory from 1962. Um, I do want you to know the names. Schachter, S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-R, Schachter, and Singer. This is just spelled like the word Singer. Um, anyway, so they came up with the two-factor theory there. Uh, once again, 1962. Uh, according to this theory, when you experience a stimulus, you have a bodily response. This is so far just like the James Lang theory. Uh, then you apply, this is the new part, then you apply an emotion label to explain the changes you're feeling in your body. And then finally, you feel the emotion brought on by the situation. So the two-factor theory is, is like the James Lang theory, but with an extra step of applying an emotion label to the bodily reactions. And it is this emotion label that causes you to feel that emotion. So you can see here in the sequence, they've included this, this they've included the emotion label. Without that, it would be the James Lang theory. So the bear is approaching, your body responds, and then you, you try to make sense of why your body's responding. You say, oh, there's a bear approaching. It's scary. I must I must be feeling fear. And then you experience the emotion of fear. And the reason why, you know, they came out with this two-factor theory, and the two factors are the body response and the emotion label. That's what they that's what it, the two factors refer to. Um, the thing is, in the James Lang theory, you would need a separate set of body responses for each emotion. Like, you know, if the body response is causing a certain emotion, then, you know, for sure it's easy to say, if my heart's pounding fast and my palms are sweating, I must be afraid. But you know what? Your heart will be beating fast and your palms will be sweating if you're really excited, like on a roller coaster. And you would get the same reaction if you're really uh, anxious about something. Or let's say you're sexually aroused somewhat or ex sexually excited about some you know, uh, there's an attractive person that you're that you're talking to. Like you're going to get some of the same reaction. You, your heart tends to speed up. You might get sweaty palms. Um, so there's a range of emotions: joy, anger, arousal, anxiety, excitement, fear, and they're all going to involve a heart rate increase, and they're all going to involve some of the, some other similar reactions, like sweaty palms. This was what Schachter and Singer saw as a problem in the James Lang theory, that you have to decide what this particular set of body arousal, like what is causing it? Because it's similar, it's a similar, you know, set of, of, of um, conditions, whether you're excited or afraid. I mean, it, imagine you 
let's go back to the bear. Imagine that you were uh, filming a, a, a nature movie or, or a nature series, and you were, you know, you were in a in a let's say a bear safe cage with a camera, and all of a sudden you see the bear coming. You're certainly going to get a speedy heart, and even though you're in a cage that's meant to protect you, there's a big grizzly approaching. Like you're going to you're going to get the sweaty palms and the beating heart, but you're not going to say you're afraid. If you're that, if that's your job, you're going to be saying, you're going to be saying, telling people, I was so excited. I saw him approach and he was magnificent. You know, like it would be, it would be the same set of body response stimuli, but, but you would label it differently because of the circumstance. You meant to be there to see a bear. And this is, this is the improvement of the, of the, the two factor theory is that, is it you know we it's dependent on the situation you 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 know you you figure out what's causing your bodily reaction because most experts agree that hey, there isn't a complete unique set of bodily reactions to differentiate joy from anger from arousal from excitement from fear etc so they all have similar body reactions so anyways this emotion label is is the extra part in this in this theory. But, um, okay, some more here. Uh, this this theory theory suggests that if we apply the incorrect emotion label, then we can experience what's known as misattribution of arousal. Um, and misattribution of arousal happens due to excitation transfer. So these are connected terms that you see here on the screen. Um, excitation transfer is when you transfer bodily excitation or bodily arousal from one source onto another. And then you would have a misattribution of arousal, meaning like that you, you pick the wrong thing that was causing you, your body to respond. And so you end up feeling a, a different emotion than, than what you know than what you should be feeling in that situation. Uh, the um, the the there was a study done. Okay, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here, and and you know you see this picture of this long bridge. So let me kind of go through this quickly, and I'll return to the excitation transfer for a couple more examples, but they had um, some men walk across this scary bridge and and um, sorry, some men oh, okay um, and ha you know they halfway across the bridge there was an attractive woman um, that you know was there to interview them when they reach kind of when they reach the halfway point and um she ends up giving them the, her phone number and uh, you know kind of it's kind of a little bit flirty i guess or or maybe not but but actually no probably should play the cool but anyways so but she was attractive she gives the phone number and says you know i'm willing to, um you can call me if, and i'd be willing to share the results of the of the study with you um they also had a, a second condition where the bridge was very sturdy and it was the same procedure. Men walked across this very sturdy bridge and halfway across the, there was an attractive female experimenter who, you know, um, gave them the, gave her, gave the men her phone number and said, you can contact me later if you want to, you know, find out the results of the study. And, um, The men that crossed this scary bridge in this picture uh, felt more attraction or displayed more attraction to the experimenter uh, than did the men who crossed the safer bridge. And what the result suggests is that the men on this scary bridge misattributed their physiological responses. They assumed that their fast heartbeats and increased sweating were related to being attracted to the woman, not to being scared by crossing the high bridge. And so 
what you find is that when you know this was a what you find is that this was an example of ex excitation transfer. Their body was all pumped up because they were crossing a scary bridge. So just you know, when they meet the attractive female, and uh, she gives them a phone number, you know, to contact her for results. I mean, they they say, oh, you know, like I'm feeling this internal, you know, kind of uh, excitation or arousal, and and they and they and remember in this theory, you do an emotion label. You kind of you what you do is you look at you figure out you know, what situation you're in. And all this ha happens very quickly, by the way. Like, I'm not saying like you sit there and ponder it, but it, based on the situation you in, you're in, you apply the emotion, oh, I'm, I'm really attracted to her, is what these men did. They applied that because even though they were on Scary Bridge, but she was the most relevant thing at the time. They were, they were talking to her. They felt all this, their heart was beating and because of the, their, their fear. And, and then they just, kind of put it all onto, oh, it must be because I'm attracted to her. And, and they didn't, the men on the safe bridge did not experience the same level of attraction. And, and they actually tested by seeing how many of them called this woman. And Okay, anyway, so, so hopefully that makes sense. Is that, is that what can happen sometimes, according to this theory, and what we do know, and what we actually know does happen in life, is, is that sometimes you get bodily arousal and you put it onto like you you think about your situation and you, and you attribute it to something that actually didn't cause it um a couple of, a couple of examples um people that like let's say you um engage in vigorous exercise um maybe maybe aerobics uh, you're running uh, you you run for some miles and you know you're that's certainly going to get your body pumped up you're going to be experiencing a lot of bodily sensations, you know, bodily arousal. And let's say you're just kind of finishing your run and you're, you're, you're going to this change room. There's a change room for um, and somebody just kind of, um, you know, somebody accidentally bumps into you. It would not be surprising if this person who just finished the run, you know, were all of a sudden to show anger towards that person that accidentally bumped into them. Um, they're all pumped up. They have all this, this bodily arousal. And it's kind of like this theory suggests that you're looking for an emotion label. Like you, 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 you want, you know, you want to label why, am, why is my body like this? And, and I mean, part of you knows that, you know, you just ran and whatnot, but, but when something presents itself, like the woman on the bridge, like, or somebody bumps into you, all of a sudden that gives you a target, like, and, it, and your bodily arousal that came from the exercise often quickly turns to anger towards this person. And it's like, watch it, buddy. And you're all like, you know, you're, you, you get all, all mad for a moment, um, which wouldn't happen if you're totally calm. Like normally somebody bumps into you and you're, you have no bodily excitement. It'd be like, oh, no big deal. Uh, let, let me give you another example, um, which involves a drug effect. Suppose, um, you know, let's say you're you're with a friend and you guys decide you're gonna watch a movie together. Um and he says, Oh, I got some um I got some punch. And um you know, let, you know I'll I'll bring us in each a glass of punch. And you don't realize it, but this is like a one of those energy drink punches. And he doesn't tell you it didn't. Um I don't know, he doesn't think to tell you and and so you drink this large glass of of energy drink. So you have no idea that that you're that you're now you know that you're now getting bodily aroused because of the energy drink and all the caffeine and and um and you're watching the movie and and at some point you decide this movie is incredibly stimulating and this would be a, you know exactly fit this this two factor theory. You're feeling something internally and. And it's like, I'm, I, you know, later on, you might be saying, I was sitting on the edge of my seat. Well, you're sitting on the edge of your seat because you're full of caffeine. But, but you don't, if you don't realize that, then you look for a reason for it. It must be because the movie was so exciting, you know, and, or, you know, the, maybe you're listening to music and it was so, the music was so stimulating that, 
oh, I could feel it throughout my body. Like, and this this certainly happens. We when we get bodily responses, we want to our brains quickly try to figure out what causes them. And if you don't know the actual cause, like you don't know you you just ingested a whole bunch of caffeine, you mm-hmm. look for something in your immediate surroundings. Like you're watching this movie. It must be so exciting. And then months later, you'll you'll watch it for a second time saying, hey, that movie wasn't so good after all. Like <laughs> you're watching it in a normal state. But this is once again, this is misattribution of arousal caused by ex- excitation transfer. You transferred the excitation from the caffeine in your body to the movie, to the experience of watching the movie. You attribute it, so you misattributed where your arousal came from. Um, okay, let's go on. Um, I got notes all over the sheet. Just give me one moment here. And, okay, I do think I'm, I'm done with this theory then. Um, you know, I thought about going through this. I, I've decided not to. Uh, I do want you to look at it in the test book. I've decided to leave it for you. You, it's it's somewhat of a complicated experiment, um, and I would I would probably cover it if we were face to face in class. But so I could check. Uh, you know, I could ask questions and, and find out if you know, if I'm getting it through right. Because, but anyways, it's. I've decided to leave it for you guys to read it on your own. Um, but it is about the two-factor theory. And and it's a test of it. And it's, you know, the results support the two-factor theory. So um, do, um, do read it over and, and try to understand, you know, exactly what the conditions were and what they were testing. Okay. Here is a summary of the three theories we just looked at. Once again, they often ask about them on the tests. Try to keep them straight. This this um, chart here is on page 364. Um, just quick review, James Lang theory. Uh, bodily responses are the basis for feeling emotions. You have a bodily response that leads to a certain emotion. Cannon Bard theory. You... Um, your cortex processes information from the environment, like a, a bear or whatever, an attractive woman. Uh, anyways, and the body gives a response at the exact, you know, at roughly the same time as you experience the emotion. So they happen simultaneously. The two-factor theory. It's the description is how a person thinks about and labels bodily responses as a basis for emotions. So you end up feeling the label that you apply, whether right or wrong. I mean, if I'm all jacked up with caffeine and, and don't know it, I'm going to think whatever I'm doing is is exciting and thrilling. You know, I was, you know, I was really pumped up playing that game or whatever, you know, whatever activity I'm doing. You know, I was really into talking to my friend today. It was like, I know, we really got going. And like, because you, you always want, you know, we don't like unexplained bodily reactions. We we want to attribute them to something. So you attribute them to whatever you know is makes most sense in your environment. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go on. Next section now. Your body and your brain influence your emotions. And I don't spend a lot of time on this, but these are what what you call body maps of emotions. Uh, these maps represent areas of the body that people report are more active, which are the warm colors, the, the red and the yellow colors, or less active, which are the cool colors like the the blue or yeah, basically different shades of blue, um, uh, when they experience different emotions. They, you know, so they have a whole bunch of subjects that that kind of they kind of label their where they feel emotions in their bodies and and they came up with these body maps kind of based on averaging a whole bunch of subjects for each emotion um the color bar reflects the extent of increasing activity yellow being like very active or decrease decreasing activity and light blue is is the most act most um decreased a- activity 
you know, meaning like less activity than normal in that part of the body. So if you look at this, you can, you know, you can see some things like, you know, the emotion that has the lowest overall activity is certainly depression. The third from the left on the bottom, in the bottom row, row, it's all like dark, it's all blue and black and there's no yellow or, or red or orange at all. So it shows that, you know, during depression, people uh, feel that their body is very much less active. Um, um, also, you see a lot of that with sadness in the top row. It's pretty dark as well. Um, as far as um, on the other side of things, the, the emotion that seems to cause the most bodily activity is, is probably love. It's got the most yellow in it. Although happiness in the top one, you know, goes all the way down to the, the feet. It's kind of like the whole body, you know, feels happiness according to these subjects. Anyway, so, you know, somewhat interesting. I uh, come up with these body maps, but um, I don't really get into them any further than that. But make sure you read about them in the book. Okay. Uh, I want to point out that I deleted two slides that if you... Um, printed out the, the note-taking handouts. You might have two slides about lie detection, you know, polygraph and, and lie detection slides. Uh, we They're not actually covered. Um, so I've deleted them from my slides here. Um, so you don't, although it is interesting material, you can read it certainly on your own, but you it won't be covered on the, on the test. So moving on to the next covered area is emotions from brain processes and we'll start with the, the amygdala processes the emotional significance of stimuli and generates immediate emotional and behavioral reactions remember the amygdala is is in the, within the limbic system you know which is our emotional center uh, information reaches the amygdala along two separate pathways the first path is a quick and dirty system, which processes sensory information nearly instantaneously. Um, and so it, it processes information before you have really analyzed the stimuli. It's like having an immediate gut reaction. The second pathway is, the path is somewhat slower, but it leads to more deliberate and thorough evaluations because other brain areas are involved. And so it's, it's, it's a more deliberate, thoughtful process of, of, um, of figuring out, you know, what you feel about a situation. So you, there's two pathways, a quick one that leads to a gut reaction and a slower one that leads to a, a, a you know, a, a more thorough evaluation. Uh, we'll look at this further on the next slide. So sensory information, just looking at the picture of the brain here, sensory information passes through the thalamus. Remember the nickname? We called it the relay station back in the, in, in the uh, second module because all of our sen sense information passes through it, visual and auditory information and touch information. It all goes through the thalamus before move, moving on to, you know, a specific cortex. Uh, so sensory information passes through the thalamus to brain areas that process emotion, including the amygdala. And so there's a fast path that sends information straight from the thalamus to the amygdala for immediate action. And let me get my pointer out here when I use this. There's my laser pointer. So like, just notice uh, how close together they are. So the fat, and we, we can it's labeled, labeled in this diagram over here. The fast path is straight from the thalamus to the amygdala. So it's a very short route and you and it you know so you get very quick processing going on. Um, the slower route goes from the thalamus to the visual cortex, which remember is at the very back of the brain, and then to the amygdala. So it's it's a, a much more extensive route. Um, obviously, like like even that is is really really quick in, in terms of brain time, but but it's going to take significantly longer. Even though know, both are very quick, but it's going to take much longer than the direct path from thalamus to amygdala. 
So we have a faster and a slower path. Um, so the slow path sends information to the visual cortex for additional processing before it reaches the amygdala. <laughs> what the slow path is going to allow is for you to make sense of what you've just seen. You know, it, whereas the in the fast path, you haven't even processed the visual information, and 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 yet you may have some kind of gut reaction or a startle response. Um, let me give you an example. And so I was thinking of an example, and, and so just follow me here. Imagine you're you're alone in a room. Um, and I pick an example. This this is what I do sometimes. My I, I have an office in, in my home and. And it's also where sometimes I'll, I'll relax to, to watch movies. Or I might turn off the lights and put my headphones on for quiet. Anyway, so back you're alone in a room. Maybe it's dimly lit or dark. And you're watching an exciting movie. You got hit noise-canceling headphones on, so you can't hear anything else that's happening in the house. And um, and you happen to, you know, at some point you happen to turn your head slightly. And you notice, that, like, you turn your head slightly, and there's a person standing there, like, one foot away from you, slightly behind you. Like the last you knew it, you were alone in this room. There's, you turn your head slightly, oh, there's a person right there. Well, you would likely have an immediate startle response, right? You would like, oh, like you would jump. Um, you know, when you get when you get spooked like that, when you get scared because somebody you know, all of a sudden somebody is like where you didn't expect them. Or um, then, you know, shortly after you would realize, you know, who it was and and you would and you know you would you would get calm again. Like let's say it was my daughter, for instance, or my it could be my daughter or my wife, the other two people I live with. So, so like you know, I, I'm watching the movie. I'm completely into it. I don't hear anyone come in. I just turn my head slightly, and there's a person right like one foot away from me standing there. And I would, I'm sure I, I would just jump out of my skin for a moment. And then like it would be like really quick. Still, I would say, oh you know, Silver or, or Nancy or, you know, whichever one it was, like, uh, you know, oh, you scared me. I, you know, and this is what we typically say. You tell the person, oh, you scared me. Uh, you know, what is it that you want? Like, so you would immediately, you know, you immediately get much calmer. Anyways, this is demonstrating the two paths. The startle response comes from the fast path, the thalamus to the amygdala. When I first turn and there's a person standing there, I react before I have any idea who it is. You know, I, I'm not responding to the visual, to the specific visual information. The, there, you do some, some, some type of visual processing, even like within the thalamus. You do some initial processing. It's not detailed, but, but it's enough. Like I would know there's a person standing right there, but I haven't had time to analyze it. Be, you know, until I until I send the information also on the slow path. And so, like, wait, after I have that startle response, I get the results back from the visual cortex telling me that it's my daughter standing there and I'd immediately calm down, let's say. Um, so this is um, this is how the, the, the amygdala kind of works in, in, in the, and this is what causes, like, you know, immediate kind of startle responses is that you have this fast path that bypasses you making sense of the visual information. Um, but you, you know, like I said, there's some initial visual processing in the thalamus. So it's enough to startle you, you know. Um, okay. I think I can go on here. Okay, continuing with the amygdala. The amygdala is involved in the perception of social stimuli. We um, We read people's faces, facial expressions, uh, and the, the amygdala helps us interpret them. So that's very useful. So, um, you know, if you look at these two faces here, uh, hopefully none of you have damaged amygdalas. And let's say you wanted to approach one that you thought was trustworthy. I think we could all agree that we'd probably go to that woman um, rather than that, you know, sneering guy who does not look trustworthy uh, with that facial expression and the shifty eyes. Um, and we have this ability. We, when we look at people's faces, we, we, immediate, we get like an immediate reaction about whether we feel good towards them or 
or is there something shady about them or and and this is a protective device um people with damage to their amygdala cannot determine whether the facial expression in a or b shows trustworthiness if you if you have a damaged amygdala you can see the information but you actually can't interpret it they they would be um, just as likely to approach the sneering guy as as the smiling woman. Um, people with with this kind of amygdala damage tend to be unusually friendly, and they're not cautious with with strangers. You know, so so the amygdala helps you to avoid potentially dangerous situations in life by causing a physiological fear response, an immediate kind of fear response. It's not always going to be like. You know, I'm not talking about great fear. It's like, but, you know, you look at somebody and it's like, ah, I'm not going to approach him. You know, like, you get a, you get an immediate kind of response. And you, you might not call it fear, but that's but that's what it's based in. It's like, there's something that could be off in this situation. I, I, or there's something about this person's face that I'm not going to put my trust in them. Um, and, you, you know, hopefully you can all relate. We, we, you you can really there's times where you can just tell that somebody is completely you know happy go lucky harmless person and they're constantly smiling like like the face gives you a lot of information about a person. Let's go on here. Uh, I'm not I'm just certainly I never cover this here. I I left the slide up. Um, you should go ahead and read it on your own. It's kind of an aside, you know. Uh, um, how understanding emo motivation and emotion can help you with customers um, in business. So go ahead and read that on your own. And in this last section of this learning objective, we're gonna look at how, yeah, you know, ways that people try to regulate their emotional states. Um, James Gross is, is the um, person that, that came up with this list, I guess, and he outlined several strategies that people use to regulate their emotions. Um, so the first ones here are thought suppression and rumination. I'll tell you right off the bat, these tend not to work well. Uh, when we suppress negative thoughts, we are trying not to feel or respond to the emotion at all. It's extremely difficult to decide not to think about something, and it often leads to a, a rebound effect where you you end up thinking about the ne negative situation even more because you're trying to push it out of your mind. Um, rumination involves thinking about elaborating and focusing on undesired thoughts or feelings. It's kind of the opposite of thought suppression. With rumination, you you dive right in to the undesired thoughts and or feelings, you know, and you you think about them, you elaborate on them, you dwell on them, you wallow in in that negative emotion, um, and focus on it. So like, it's kind of like you're hyper examining it and you're going over it in your mind over and over. And um, I can tell you that uh, with my notes here. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm losing my place. I, 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 I oh, oh, it, I can tell you that it's particularly unhealthy and can lead to anxiety or depression. It is one of the causes, rumination is one of the causes of anxiety or depression and depression. Uh, I can also tell you that females are more likely than males to engage in rumination. Studies have shown this, or engage in co rumination, which is two females getting together and talking back and forth about their problems, you know, their, their negative situations or problems. And they kind of, you know, keep building on each other and, 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 and it can cause a real downward spiral. Um, sometimes it, it could be uh, this situations where it's been uh, like a mother and a daughter or, or two siblings or two best friends. I mean, but, but it, it's not healthy to keep dwelling on, on a negative situation and keep going over it. Why did, he dumped me or whatever it might be uh, over and over. Um, it, it, it is one of, certainly one of the paths to, to depression. Um, okay, a more positive approach is positive reappraisal. 
where we directly alter our emotional reactions to events by thinking about those events in more neutral terms. Uh, you can use positive appraisal, you know, once again, it involves changing your thoughts about an event in a positive way. You can use it to successfully regulate emotions. I'll give you an example. You know, thinking of an exam as a threat can lead to fear and anxiety. But if you think of it as a positive challenge or a chance to show what you know, you can, you know, this, this will help to create more positive emotions about the exam. Um, and maybe plenty of research backs, backs this up that it, that it um, that, you know, we can do these little mind tricks with ourselves. I think of them as mind tricks. And that's, don't necessarily write that down, but it's not like the official term, but uh, it's positive reappraisal. But but it is kind of a mind trick. I'll just, I, I like to use that term. It's, it's like, you can like, it's like, look, you know, you just, you decide to look at something differently. You decide to put it in a new light. And, and it really does affect how you feel about it. This is, it's almost like finding the silver lining in any negative situation or making the best of a bad situation. You decide to think about it differently in a more positive way. Um, and if you can actually successfully do that, it's, it's a great little way, a great little, you know, mind trick to, to help to regulate negative emotions throughout life. Um, okay, we got a couple more on the last slide here. Uh, humor, I'm just going to read this section. It has many mental and physical health benefits. Laughter improves the immune system and stimulates the release of hormones, dopamine, serotonin, and endorphins. When we laugh, we experience rises in circulation, blood pressure, skin temperature, and heart rate, along with a decrease in pain perception. Uh, so this is, you know, another thing just like fear or anxiety or arousal that, you know, get your heart racing, is, you know, laughter. <laughs> um, maybe when you see that bear, you, you might, and you get this bodily response, you might say, oh, this is really funny. Or, oh, no, probably not. Okay. Anyways, uh, we've all heard that laughter is the best medicine, and research supports that it is beneficial. Uh, for example, those that can find things to laugh at while at a funeral tend to tend to fare better emotionally in the long run. Um, okay. Uh, distraction is, is the final um, way to, you know, way that people try to regulate their emotional states. It involves doing or thinking about something other than the troubling activity or thought. So it's a little bit better than, than just to back up here, a little bit better than thought depression. You're not just trying to push it out of your mind. You're replacing, instead of saying, I don't want, I'm just not, I'm going to try purposely not to think about this. You're actually just, oops, you're distracting yourself by engaging in other activity. So it is a step up from, from simple thought suppression, which is just, you know, purposely trying to push it out. You got to let it flow out of your mind naturally by distracting yourself. So this is also a useful strategy. Uh, some distractions do backfire, however, as we may end up thinking about other problems. Um, and you have to make sure that the distraction's not gonna be anything that reminds you of, of the problem you're trying not to think about right now. Uh, you need the distraction to be something carefree that you can immerse yourself into. Uh, the more the immersive the experience, the better. You know, you know, something that's really kind of, kind of going to take your thoughts away. Like maybe watch a, a science fiction show or a movie or a fantasy or something and, or whatever. You know, I don't know. Go engage, play a game with something that you're really into or whatever it be. Something that you can really kind of focus on and get into. And you want, once, once again, you want to make it sure it's something that won't remind you of your negative situation. So, you know, if you, if you got a recent funeral or something, don't watch a movie that deals with somebody dying or a funeral situation like even if it is a comedy or something it, you know you got to be careful um okay anyways that will conclude learning objective nine from module three